What's up, nerds? Welcome back. Now, if you know me, you know that I love reading comics, collecting comics, talking about comics. And if you're like me, you love comics, including and especially independent comics. And if you're like me, you love comics that have to do with horror and supernatural type of stories. And that's exactly what I'm holding in my hands today. So let's talk about The Veil Walker number one. Now, this is one of the comics that I backed on Indiegogo, and they actually are funding the second issue right now, so that is still in development, it is on its way. I will be putting a link to it in the description, just in case you want to go and, you know, get it, because you can actually get the first issue with the second issue if you go and back this, like, second campaign. So make sure that you, you just go and check that out, give it a look over for me, just do it for me, as a personal favor to me. You don't owe me any favors, but I'm going to cash one in anyway. So let's just kind of talk about the story that we do have here in our hands with issue number one, so that way I can kind of give you a little bit of the lay of the land, in case you're just curious, what is this about? So, for one thing, we're going to start out here. This guy, who is a, um, I guess you could call him a YouTuber, I don't know, maybe he's also, like, Twitch type of person, but whatever. He's one of those people that apparently goes into, like, haunted houses and old abandoned, like, they used to be called asylums, we're not supposed to use that anymore, I think mental hospital is the correct term that we're supposed to use now, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, it changes every few years. So, he's in here and he's, like, you know talking to his chat or to his, you know, audience and telling them, you know, before y'all go on in the chat, yes, this is a house and he calls it a loony house, which I think is even less politically correct. So I'm going to give him points for that. Anyway, so he says, so this was a privately owned insane asylum. There you go. He put all the words together. Insane asylum that got closed down back in like 98. And then, this part actually legitimately made me laugh, where he's like, but before I tell you why, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Raid Shadow, and he gets like cut off because he was about to say Raid Shadow Legends, which, <laughs> if you've been on YouTube, I mean, for any amount of time, they haven't really been around that much lately, not that I've seen, but for a while, pretty much everybody's channel was pretty much sponsored in some way by Raid Shadow Legends, except for mine, but, you know, not bitter about it, I'm just, I'm just saying. So anyway, he gets all of a sudden just enveloped by these tentacles and starts getting dragged away. And that's where we see these three guys are like watching him. And there's only one of them who can actually see the tentacles. He's like, do you guys see that? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, what tentacles? He's like, you guys really don't see that. And the dude's like, what are you talking about, weeb? So we kind of cut over from there over to another town in Massachusetts. And we see this individual. His name is actually Rome. He's coming into this house. And as you can see, he's immediately beset upon by some supernatural force that throws this table at him but luckily he has this badass shield that is like that comes out of his um armband gauntlet some people would call it a gauntlet whatever so he has this thing that creates a shield and so he's able to deflect that or really it kind of like breaks on the shield so which is even better so anyway he puts away the shield and he's looking around like where the hell did this thing go like did it jump out the damn window but then when he goes over to the window he's like no something came in because the glass is like coming inward if they had something had jumped out the glass would be on the other side so he turns around because he hears like a yell and then he goes towards this room with someone saying like please don't hurt us or whatever so he walks in to immediately see this spirit demon thing being killed by a cloaked figure and then of course the people you know over there are just cowering in the corner so the guy turns around to reveal this, uh, the guy in the suit is Alexander, and then like I said, this is Rome, so they're kind of here talking, and obviously, you know, they work together, and Alexander's kind of telling him, like, you know, you're, you're too slow, you should have been here sooner, like, these people would have been dead, we would have been here to mop up what was left of them, if you hadn't, or if I hadn't shown up, you know, to clean up the mess that you weren't about to fix, so anyway, he just tells them, like, yeah, go ahead and give them the whole rundown, I'm going to leave, I got something else to go do, so that's when the... <laughs> He says, call in the cleaners and start their relocation. I've got another case. So he goes up to the couple and he's like, I know you have questions and you'll get answers in due time. I'm Rome and tall, dark and grumpy was Alexander. We are members of the Order of the Veil Guard. So that's your first little thing. One thing I'm going to stop and point out real quick is that the creator of this this book has said that he doesn't really like a whole lot of exposition, which I appreciate so very much. Not that it, he skimps on the dialogue. There's still plenty here for you to actually get the story. 
He just doesn't like it whenever you have characters, you know, talking back and forth about all these different things. Because it just, it doesn't feel natural. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to stand there and talk about these things just at length for no particular reason. We know what the reason would be. As readers, we would know it's to try and fill us in. But he's not trying to do that. He's not trying to, like, shove all of this information in your face for you to try and retain. So I actually really appreciate that because it makes the story much more enjoyable when the characters are just acting like, you know, regular people. Like, like you would expect. So... Anyway, we go back over to the town where that guy was um, streaming when he got, you know, taken by the tentacles. And then he pulls up to the crime scene. The cops are like, you know, who the hell are you? Why are you here? And then he tells them that basically he's a private investigator. So they're like, what? So they call it out on the radio like, hey, we got like a PI here. Does he have clearance? And then they hear over the radio that, yes, yeah, go ahead and let him through like he's supposed to be here. So he comes over and he apparently knows her like they've worked together in the past is what she ends up saying later on. And she's just kind of giving him a little bit of the rundown. She's saying, uh, wasn't expecting you to be the one that they sent. So she knows at least a little bit. I am not entirely sure how much she knows about the Order of the Veil Guard, but I'm sure we're going to find out more as time goes on. Anyway, so she basically already knows that he's from that organization. And he says, I was in town. I hope you didn't move the body. And she says, honestly, I think this is something you shouldn't be wasting your time with. So he says, the Veil Guard had to shut down a satellite just to end a live stream, which... I mean, for one thing, that really does kind of, uh, it does establish how much influence they have that they were able to shut down a damn satellite, but at the same time, I'm like, damn, that's, that's, yeah, that makes sense. You would have to shut down a, a satellite to get a stream taken down because, well, I don't know. I guess it depends on the platform, you know what I mean? I, it depends on how much pull they would have with, I don't know, YouTube or some shit like that, which is not much, you know what I mean? YouTube tends to do whatever they want, but now I'm going off on a different tangent. Anyway, I digress. So he says, your circumstances state otherwise. So this is when they come over to the uh, the more surly, older veteran, I think he's a te detective, Alexander Meet Detective Peters. So he's just saying, like, it's a, sh it's a pleasure or whatever. He says, wish I could say the same. What alphabet boy are you? I couldn't get a damn word out of brass. He's like, good. We tend to like to keep it that way. So they walk in. He says, your police report mentioned one of the kids said he saw tentacles. Is that kid still here? And she says, yeah. And unfortunately for him, I'm pretty sure he'll get flagged. So he says, fate rarely accords us choices. We all meet the same end. So that's where they see the, uh, the dead body covered up, obviously, by the sheet. And it's still surrounded by candles that are all lit and just this, you know, classic type of, you know, witchcraft, supernatural magic type of stuff, whatever you want to call it, satanic ritual, it's all in good fun. Anyway, so he says, there's enough dead weight in this room, Peters, either show me the body or step aside, because he was like, yeah, we've just been standing around here waiting with, you know, our dicks in our hands, so he's like, okay, show me, he's like, what, the body or our dicks? So he's like, dude, just hurry up, I have no time for your little jokes and shit. Anyway, so this is where we see this, and this is why I was saying, like, I love horror and supernatural type shit, which is exactly everything that is contained in this one page. So, as we can see, yes, he is very much dead, that you're not going to be able to walk off that type of injury. Anyway, so, <laughs> he's telling him, like, yeah, it looks like a sacrifice, satanic maybe, and that it was ritualistic, so... She even asks, or she says, yeah, it's definitely the streamer that went missing yesterday. So we also see here where Alex has this uh, this voice in his head, as you can see by the black caption there, that basically just keeps trying to, like, goad him. And is saying right now, talk, talk, and more useless talk. You needlessly test my patience with this mundane babble. So he just completely ignores it and keeps talking to the people. He says, blood on the floor is dry, but the runes on the wrist and ankles are still fresh. So she's asking, like, well, do the markings mean anything? Could help us narrow down our search criteria. And he says, it's Wicca, but it won't help very much. To which the older detective is like, well, yeah, you know, this is Salem. Like, you know, Wiccan stuff, not exactly uncommon. And from what I know, uh, I think he said, like, from the museum or something like that. From what I remember seeing at the museum on Washington Square as a kid, these runes are incomplete. They don't mean shit. So he says, Peters, round up the kids for me. He's like, sure, I could use a smoke anyway. Want me to get you some fucking donuts while I'm at it? So, again, like I said, just the dialogue here, it hits me as correct. You always have those older type of just crotchety type of detectives, you know what I mean? Who They've been on the job for such a long time, they're just like, I don't really have time to mince words. I'm just going to hit you with what I'm actually thinking. So, I can appreciate that. But at the same time, you don't really want to talk to those people for very long. They tend to, they tend to wear on your nerves. Anyway, so... Alex is saying, who's had access to the body since it was found? She says, just us and the kids. Why? He says, all right, well, let's go have a chat with them. 
And then he's thinking to himself, be not deceived with the first appearance of things, for show is not substance. One thing I'm going to say, I love that they actually have thought bubbles here. You so rarely ever get actual thought bubbles in modern comics, so I was actually happy to see that. Just a little touch, but I was like, you know, I like that. Anyway, so he goes to the, the kids, the ones who were watching the live stream, because they actually ended up coming over to the house. And we have that type of thing where, like, one of them starts telling the story, and then, like, each... Each of them, like, continues the story, so almost as if they're all telling, like, the exact same thing. So, he's standing there and he asks, like, okay, walk me through it again, what happened? So they tell him, we were watching this goofy-ass dude streaming, and, I don't know, he just got yanked out of nowhere. We knew the place because it's on our bus route, and when we came in, it smelled like shit. And I couldn't see any marks, but we didn't stick around to check out some naked dead dude. So... After they give him the whole rundown, you know, basically they let the kids go, and, you know, this one, the one who basically was the only one who actually saw the tentacles, he, uh, we see where his, like, aunt is the one who comes to pick him up, and he's like, you know, I'm sorry, or whatever, she's like, no, no, sorry, nothing, like, I'm gonna tell your mom about this, and don't you ever do this shit again, type of thing, so, I come from that type of family, so I completely understand that type of interaction, anyway, so Alex tells them, kids said the markings weren't there when they saw the body. So it says, sounds like we should open up this place back up and throw their batshit crazy asses in a cell. So that's when she's telling Peter's like, you know why the asylum was closed in the first place? And he's like, yeah, an employee murdered a, maybe a few patients, maybe 19, 20 years ago. And she's even asking like, weren't you on the force back then? And he says, you're making an old man think back. But from what I remember, it seems similar. So Alex is saying, why didn't you make that connection sooner? He's like, listen here, Ricky Martin. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. It's probably a copycat or some loony. Because I gunned down that prick myself, which... Okay, more pieces of the puzzle. That just that tells you even more. If he's willing to say, I gunned down that prick myself, he's seen some shit. He's done some shit. So, okay. Anyway, so we can see where there's this, this spirit that is heading towards the... Um, towards the building, and then Alex's, I'm going to assume this is his, like, avatar or something, you know what I mean? Like, earlier, obviously, when we saw him killing that other demon thing, he took on a different appearance, and from the cover, you can tell he probably takes on that appearance. So, I'm assuming, like I said, this is his, like, avatar or whatever the hell, the one that's speaking to him in the black bubbles. And it says, see, it seems tonight might not be such a bore after all. Two meals in a single day? Oh, Alexander, you spoil me. So he's even telling, like, Alex is over here telling uh, Detective Peters, like, yeah, you stopped caring, like, a long-ass time ago. It's just very evident. He says, Harris, there's an old med center inside. Have the body moved there. I have someone coming in for an autopsy. I want my specialist to take a good look at the body before anyone else goes poking around in it. To which Detective Peters is like, well, that's not protocol. And she says, I'll radio Officer Jordan and Soto to move in. So he says, I need to grab something from my car. You have a look around and have a look around. You two stick with the body till my guy gets here. So... Again, Detective Peters is, like, very pissed that he's having to just, like, basically take orders. He's like, this is not how this is supposed to work. Like, I shouldn't have to be listening to him. Can't believe the chief allowed some shit PI to break protocol like this. To which she's telling him, like, some agency with a ton of pull called it in. I've worked a case with him before you. And then he says, uh, make sure to bring that pathologist here before heading out. So the cops are like, well, yeah, you don't have to tell us twice. I was dying to get out of here. And the other one's like, don't hold your breath. I bet we'll get hung up on something. So a little bit of foreshadowing there you're about to see exactly what i mean anyway so detective peters is like get going before i write both of you up and says i don't get paid enough to deal with dipsticks like those two i shouldn't have come back to this shithole of a town she's asking like well why did you transfer away in the first place to which he basically just says you know my wife wanted to be closer to family but you know now we're here again anyway so this is when the specialist shows up for the autopsy and he kind of goes over to you know start working on it and he's also giving his own you know very um weird type of vibe where he's saying uh, the body is a ballad of rhyme and reason one must take their time listen to it enjoy the melodious details written on the flesh everybody has a story detective be a doll and get that blanket off the deceased please this one's a piacere bello anyway he says i'm simply aroused by the possibilities lying beneath aroused you say <laughs> there have been um, many things that have roused aroused me but a dead body has never been one of them so hey you know to each his own different strokes for different folks and sometimes they're dead strokes so you know anyway so this is where i was talking about like the cops take off they're leaving and everything and then they're even having this little conversation where you know they're basically saying like you know this place kind of creeps me out or whatever and then uh one of them the the one on the i don't know i'm like i don't know which way which side this is going to be on for y'all i guess the left 
Yeah, the on your left, right where my finger is pointing. This guy is talking about how he used to come here it's basically to get high with some of his friends. He's asking the other cop, like, didn't you ever do that? He's like, nah, I'm from Southie. Never once came up this far till my transfer. He's like, good for you. As you can see, this place has always had, I don't know, uh, like a funky feeling to it, man. And we can see as they're walking by, they have like one of those like horror movie tropes where there's just like a shadowy figure off in the hallway. So again, I love it. I love the horror touches. Anyway. So he's saying, well, good thing we're out of here. Donuts on the way back to the station. <laughs> the other one's like, your fat ass is the reason cops have a rep. So anyway, he's trying to open the door and isn't able to open it. So the other one's like, dude, stop playing around. Hurry up and open it. And then they can sense something is sneaking up on them. So they turn around a little bit spooked. And then we can see where they're just kind of looking and something is reaching for them. So this is where I was saying, you know, the whole thing about them getting hung up. Yeah, literally hung up. So, <laughs> unfortunate, and we can see from this panel down here, yeah, they didn't make it, so. Anyway, we go back over to the autopsy, and the specialist is saying, hmm, if this young man's head wasn't stuffed in his thoracic cage, I'd say he was still alive by the look of his tissue. And then um, one of them is saying, it's been almost eight hours since he was found. Right now, only he and his killer know how long he's actually been dead. So he goes and opens the mouth and finds this little scroll inside. So he's like, ah, well, that's interesting. And he says that it's a, a scroll of sealing, a sealing scroll. So Detective Peters is like, you say that like you believe it works. But then Harris asks, like, well, what's it supposed to be sealing? He's like, you mean, what was it sealing or something like that? You mean, what was it sealing? Yeah, I think you two should see yourselves out immediately. And then we can see where, yeah, the thing is back. So I... I it would seem that this scroll was the only thing basically keeping him down. And now that they took the scroll, it, um, it's not keeping him down anymore. So he comes, he's like sneaking up on them. But anyway, we cut back over to Alex, who's still kind of looking around. And then he walks into a room, door slams behind him. He's like, ah, shit, they trapped me. Like, I'm slipping. I should have known that this was going to be basically walking into a trap. So he says, yeah, I'm slipping. And then we, he hears again the dark voice telling him, like trying to grasp the tide or howl at strong winds in order to incur favor. Mortals never cease to dispel the silly notion that they can bend destiny and in turn wield unfathomable, unfathomable power to rebuke even God. So he just says, your interminable games will need to wait, Leech, at least a while longer. So he throws down the umbrella because basically... That's where he has the sword. So, of course, he pulls out the sword. And I love this. Whenever his eyes start glowing, it just looks so cool. Anyway, he says, I can undo this spell if I break one of the lines to the summoning circle. And as we can see, that's not going to be very easy because there are actually two of these spirits that he has to contend with. So, it's telling him, the voice is telling him again, you grow too slow, encumbered by weakness. A short fuse whose spark is fizzling into smoke. Unleash me and end this struggle. But, of course, he's like, nah. So... He goes on fighting, he says, this haze in the air, like, it feels familiar. So we go on again, you know, with this fight, and I actually love this. Like, I, I'm an appreciator of fight scenes in general, but when it has to deal with, you know, just spooky ghost monsters like this, even better. And especially when you're, we like, waving around, a ma uh, like, a magic sword, basically. So I really appreciate that. Anyway, he's saying, like, I'm not going to be able to disrupt the circle or whatever, but he, like, slides over to the umbrella and says, but this can... So he throws it over towards the circle to kind of like uh, disrupt it, which does end up working. He speaks the magic incantation and takes care of the ghost. So it says, uh, finally, more essence in which to grow my might. So he's just kind of standing there and then he says, I have felt this energy before. I had hoped not to see the glow of this moon again. This is the veil. And then the spirit or the his avatar, whatever it is, is saying like that apparently it's home. So he's like, okay, I need to sense where the others are and quickly. And then all of a sudden we hear or we see the sound effect for three, I'm assuming maybe they're gunshots. Yeah, because they're blams. So it has to be gunshots. Anyway, the voice is telling him the hourglass has turned tick tock, Alexander, as he has like the whole like him opening his eye. And of course, now things are getting real. So that's actually where this leaves off. And we will be getting into issue two pretty soon hopefully like i said right now the campaign is ongoing so like i said i will be putting a link to that in the to the description so that way you can go and check this out because this story is really good you know what i mean it um it moved at a brisk pace but it's actually very entertaining very engaging and it actually had the perfect setup for what we're going to be dealing with here and then also after when you get to like the very end of it there's just some more you know information about like different 
elements of the story and the world here. I'm talking about totems and like wraiths, the Satani, the Veil Walkers, or the Grand, what is it, the Grand uh, Commanders. And so we get more of that information because there are people who just want to know, you know, more information like this. And this is what I actually enjoy when you put it in here like this, instead of having it all, like I said, in the exposition with just them talking about all of this for no particular reason, you can just put it in the back and the people who really want to know that information, they're going to read it. I did. So that's what I'm saying. Like people who want to know are going to read that part. And if people just want to read the story, well, they can still get the entertaining story. They might not really worry so much about, you know, the deep, deep lore of the story, which is fine. Everybody has, you know, different reasons for wanting to read a comic book. This one, I, I would like to say that this one probably serves everyone's needs, everyone's interests. I mean, as long as you don't have a problem with, like I said, horror elements and ghosts and things like that. That's my type of thing. As you all know, I've mentioned that many times on my channel. I'm into the supernatural stuff, so it definitely was right up my alley. But... I can't wait to see what happens with the second issue. Of course, I already backed it. So make sure y'all go and, you know, just give it a look. Now that you've heard me talk about the first issue, what have you got to lose? Go check it out. Just look, get into it. Get into it with me. We can start some sort of reading club or something. That's actually not a bad idea. Just thought of that on the fly, but that's not a bad idea. Hmm. I might have to try and develop that idea some more. Anyway, so yeah, make sure you go and check this out. I don't really have much else to say here. I mean, I loved everything about it. The art was awesome. The writing was great. Dialogue really served the characters. Like, each character had their own, you know, individual feel to them. It really felt like all of the characters, even just like those cops who got killed, it felt like everybody had been thought out. So everyone had a place in the story. Everybody served the story in some way. And overall, it just made for an entertaining read. Even... I read it twice, I'm not gonna lie. I read it when I first got it, then I read it again a couple days ago, I read it right before I had to do this review, and I never get tired of reading it. It's just, it's a really good story. So that's why I'm saying, you're going to wanna check out the second issue. If you don't have the first issue, you can back the tier that lets you catch up, and that way you get both of the issues. That way you don't even have to wait to read the second one. You'll get both of them at the same time, and you can just read them, so. Take that all into consideration and consider going and backing this book. But that's going to do it for me on this review. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. You have the notifications on. That way you know when I have new content coming out. Share the video if you would like. I actually had to think about that. Share the video if you would like because I do appreciate that. And if you're done here, then go and read a book. Especially this one if you have it. If you've already read it, read it again. And if you're not, then I will see you on my next video.